Welcome everyone to Common Hour. My name is Jim Strick and I'm chair of the program in science, technology and society here at FNM. I'd like to introduce our ASL interpreter, Emily Phipps. Thanks very much, Emily, for interpreting for us at Common Hour. Please note that if you need to change your screen view to include Emily as you watch, you can adjust the screen display mode in the box labeled view towards the upper right of the zoom window. You can also enable the CC closed captioning feature if you like at the bottom. A very warm welcome to all to our ninth common hour of the semester. Common hour is a unique and inclusive program that brings the Franklin and Marshall community together every week during the academic year for culturally and intellectually enriching events. It's the only regularly scheduled event that unites students, faculty, and staff, and invites the larger community to join us as well. Throughout the pandemic, the Common Hour has continued to provide a virtual gathering space and a source of inspiration, education, and compelling discussion for the FNM community and beyond. We hope you'll join us also next week for Common Hour on April 14th for a Franklin and Marshall faculty panel on the topic, Boundary, Bodies Transgressing Boundaries. Please follow Common Hour on our webpage, the Presence Events Calendar, and our FNM Common Hour Instagram page. During today's event, Zoom viewers can submit questions for our speakers via the Q&A feature. Please indicate your affiliation with the college, but we don't need your name. And now I'd like to introduce Ellen Fritz, a senior joint majoring in government and business, who will introduce our speaker today. Ellen. Thank you. Kai Omega is excited to introduce Robin Cohen as today's Common Hour speaker. Robin has forged her own path throughout her career, culminating in her current position as the chair of one of the most well-respected and perhaps most feared in the courtroom, boutique firms in New York City. Since co-launching Cohen Ziffer, 10 of the 18 attorneys hired have been women. Throughout her career, Robin has remained active in women's leadership issues and has been an advocate for diversity in the workplace. Today, Robin will be will discuss how her commitment to advancing the career of others, particularly women and diverse attorneys, has not only helped her own growth, but created business advantages for her firm in recruiting, maximizing results for clients and other areas. Robin Cohen is one of the most prominent insurance recovery litigators in the United States. She graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Magnum Cum Laude in 1983 and University of Pennsylvania Law School in 1986. In her illustrious 30-year career following graduation from UPenn, Robin has worked at high-profile law firms including Dickinson Shapiro, Kasowitz Benson, Torres and Friedman, and McCool Smith. In January of 2021, Robin and her longtime team members made the decision to start their own firm, something that is not for the faint of heart in the legal industry. Robin said that her team decided to bet on themselves, a bet that has had a huge payout. Only one year after its conception, Cohen Ziffer, Frenchman and McKenna has more than doubled in size and was named a 2021 practice group of the year for insurance by Law 360, one of only six firms recognized nationally for insurance litigation. Beyond the success of the firm she recently co-founded, Robin's personal accolades include being named MVP by Law 360 five times, named one of 50 most influential women lawyers in America by the National Law Journal, one of the top 100 trial lawyers in America, and Insurance Lawyer of the Year by Benchmark Litigation for three consecutive years. Kai Omega is thrilled to have Robin Cohen speak on her commitment to advancing the careers of others and empowering those around her. Please join me in welcoming Robin Cohen to the FNM community. Yes, yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. Thank you, Ellen, for that terrific introduction. I also want to thank the administration for FNM for sponsoring the event. And in particular, I want to thank Jeff, um, Professor Nesterik, for sponsoring this event. 
And finally, I want to thank uh, Kai Omega and um, for urging me to do this. And in particular, my daughter, Sammy Fisher, who many of you know, who is a senior graduating this year. I know it's a very exciting part of your life, and I hope I can give some advice on how to professionally grow in your fields. So um, let me just start with a little bit of a roadmap of what I'm going to discuss today. Um, I'm really going to start with my own professional journey, um, if you will, my own professional story and how um, I uh, grew um, professionally, but mostly the mistakes I made, some of the bumps in the road, and how I navigated around those bumps. And at the end of the program, I'm going to give at least 10 pieces of advice on how um, and on what I would suggest um, you do when you go out into the workplace. So let me start with my own personal story. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. Like many of you, I first, um, I first was raised in Philadelphia and then moved to the suburbs. Um, it was the township of Abington. I know some of you are, um, are from Abington Township. I went to Abington High School. Um, at the time, it was a public school with over a thousand students in my grade. Um, one thing that I really loved about the school, it was a very eclectic and very diverse student body. And so that was something that I really got out of the school. Um, when I entered in ninth grade, I was a bit of, a, of an athlete, like many of you. I was a swimmer. I played volleyball and I was also on the tennis team. Um, I learned pretty quickly um, what being a big fish in a small pond was because in junior high, I was quite an athlete, but when I got to high school and the environment was much bigger um, and my friends and the colleagues that I met were much better than I was. So I knew at that point in time, I needed to pursue other passions or pursue other hobbies. And luckily, Abington High School had what we called a creative studies program. And that program allowed you to leave the high school two or three days a week and try to pursue um, what you were passionate about or what you might want to be um, after you graduated from college. So some people worked in accounting firms, other people worked in law firms, um, some people worked in various corporations. I decided I wanted to work for a judge. Um, and so I interviewed with a couple judges down in Philadelphia and I got an internship um, in 10th grade with the chief judge of the trial division in Philadelphia. His name was Judge Guarino. And I was the only high school student. He had a lot of other interns that were law students, some from Villanova um, Law School and some from Penn Law School. And they really took me under their wing and it was a terrific experience. And at the end of the day, what I really did was I observed a lot of different types of trials. And because my judge was the chief justice, um, I got to see some very high profile trials on political corruption, rape, murder, everything under the sun. And what I learned from that experience is really twofold. First, I realized I definitely wanted to become a lawyer. And the second thing I learned is that the quality of the lawyering, either as the prosecutor or the public defender, really made a difference in whether a defendant could go free or not. And so the qualitative experience was just terrific. So as Ellen alluded to, I went to Penn undergraduate I studied sociology and psychology, took a lot of criminal reform classes, and then I applied to law school. And this is where I really had my first bump in the road. Um, like many of you, I had made a list of three or four schools that were my top choices, and I didn't get into any of those law schools. And the reason I didn't is that I was never very good in those standardized tests. 
So I had a lot of different tutors. I did took a lot of different classes and it really didn't make a substantive difference. I got the same score on my LSATs um, each and every time. So I had to navigate that disappointment. I was pretty devastated at that point in time. But what I ended up doing is I ended up going to a college that was one that wasn't one of my first choices. And then I transferred to University of Pennsylvania Law School my second year. And it turned out to be a terrific, um, terrific thing that I did. I made a lot of friends and a lot of these friends are now clients of the firm. So after I graduated law school, I knew that I wanted to do trial work. And so in 1986, there was no COVID. Um, the economy was terrific. And if you went to literally an accredited law school, you could pretty much pick your firm. And so I interviewed and I decided to go to a firm where it was a litigation boutique where I would get a lot of real trial experience. And so from day one, I started on a trial team and I realized that that's really where my talent lied, being in a courtroom, um, presenting evidence in front of a jury, arguing in front of a judge. And I did notice it wasn't that I was smarter, it's just that I was quicker on my feet. I was more nimble. And not only did I notice it, but more importantly, the senior partners at my firm noticed it. And so what happened for me professionally is I started to get more and more responsibility. And then at a pretty young age, I became lead trial counsel on a very high profile case in the insurance industry. Um, and I had a whole team behind me, but the, the trial was a three month trial and we ended up winning the trial and actually got to talk to the jury afterwards. And that really was the springboard for my career. Um, as a result of that success, um, I was able to grow my team um, to a pretty significant amount of attorneys. But more importantly, I was able to grow my practice and really bring in a lot of terrific clients that I have today. So what we decided to do, as Ellen suggested, is after going to a few firms, um, we decided, you know what, our whole team, that we were going to make a plunge and we were going to do this on our own. So we started a firm a couple years ago um, and we forged our own path. And it was, I will tell you, probably the best professional decision I have made. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, we are very committed to diversity. Um, half of our partners are women. Um, we've brought in a diversity consultant that's going to help us diversify even more. Um, and I'll tell you that not only did I want to do it because it was the right thing to do, but it was more fun. Um, I think you really bring a diversity of ideas when you have a diverse firm. But more importantly, um, what we discovered is the more diverse your trial teams are, and the more that you reflect the composition of the jury, the more successful you are gonna be at trial. And so our success rate at trials, we believe is in part because of the diversity of our teams. So that's really um, my story um, in a nutshell. And so let me start with some things I've learned along the way. Um, and the most important thing that I've learned in being successful in a law firm is you need to figure out what distinguishes you from the pack, what makes you special. Um, and for each of you, it's going to be something very different. For me, it was being in a courtroom. For you, it might be being a great writer or a great mathematician. But it's important to be self-reflective and figure out what makes you special and get that noticed in the company that you um, are, you participate in, because that is what is going to really um, um, create a great situation for your career. 
Um, one advantage I had back um, when I started was one of the things that really distinguished me from the pack was there wasn't a lot of women who were lead trial counsels. Um, my cases were one plaintiff against typically 20, 30, 40 insurance companies. And when I started to be lead trial counsel at a very young age, I was usually up against a lot of opposing counsel, mostly a sea of white men. And so it was very easy for me to distinguish myself in that arena. Even today, there's still um, um, women who are, even today in the legal industry, women are underrepresented. So here's a little bit of a chart that I'm gonna show you. And what it shows is that 52% of law school students graduate, um, I'm sorry, 52% of law school students are women that graduate, but only 24% become partners. And there's only 4% of women um, of color. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is that even today, um, there is really a low percentage of women that are lead trial counsel when you get when you have bet your company kind of cases. And so as Beth Wilkinson said, who's one of the premier trial lawyers in the country, um, the rate is abysmally low for women who are lead counsel in major bet your company cases. Um, it's less than 20% in cases involving five or more part, uh, parties. And I will tell you in cases like mine, where you have 20, 30 insurance companies on the other side, it's still less than 5%. So for those who want to distinguish themselves, um, you still can do that and pick um, the legal field, because if you're a woman or a woman of color, um, you will definitely stand out in the crowd. Um, there are other professions that also there's a paucity of women um, and are occupations that are still dominated by men. I've only listed a few, but the aerospace um, industry, the software developers, um, financial analysis, architects, and even the TV industry, those industries are dominated by men. So one of the ways, and it's just one way of distinguishing yourself is by picking a profession if you're a woman or a woman of color dominated by men. The other um, piece of advice that I would give is um, don't be cautious. Take risks, be bold. Um, this is the time in your life to be bold. Um, my father always said um, that it was better to be lucky than good, but I think that is true. But when opportunities come your way, you have to grab them. I know when you're young, you think opportunities are gonna come all the time. I will tell you looking back, they do not. And so when you are presented with an opportunity where you need to take a risk, but it's something that you're passionate about, um, my advice to you is go for it. Um, when I was working at my first firm, um, we were working for one of the top companies in the country, Phillips Electronics. And I was given an opportunity to work in-house for three months um, when one of the women in-house was going on maternity leave. And so I worked in house for three months. And then I was, when I was done, um, the senior management and the board asked me to run one of their major litigations that went to trial. And that was the first trial that um, we won. That was the trial that was high profile. And that was really the springboard for my later success. Um, Tim Cook also tells stories about what he did. Um, Tim Cook was working for one of the premier um, computer companies. You probably never even heard of it because it's no longer in existence called Compaq. He got a call from Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs had been fired from Apple two years previously. 
Um, Apple at the time was on the brink of bankruptcy and Steve Jobs asked Tim Cook to make the leap, to make the jump and come to Apple and be part of the team. And Tim Cook will tell you, and he has in many speeches, it was the best decision of his career. And now he's CEO of uh, one of the best companies in the world. So my second piece of advice is not to be cautious, not to stay within the lines, um, to really go outside the lines and be bold. The third piece of advice that I would give all of you is that you often hear about how brilliant people are, how they have a high IQ, how great they did on their LSATs or other standardized tests. Um, what I've learned through my career is that raw intelligence is overrated, that emotional intelligence is much more important in determining your success in your occupation and in your professional development. And what do I mean by emotional intelligence? Um, some people refer to it as the softer qualities. Um, are you likable? Are you charismatic? When you walk into a room, can you dominate the room? Do you get along with other people? Are you someone who's a true leader? Those are sort of the qualities that are much more indicative of whether you're going to be successful professionally, as opposed to your raw technical talents. And so I interview quite a bit around campus, um, different campuses. And when I interview, I do look at people's grades, um, but I will tell you what I'm really looking for. Um, is someone who has that special quality that I know when they walk in a courtroom, they can, they can relate to a jury, that they're genuine, that they're really quick on their feet. Um, and so, and I am not alone in how I approach hiring. In fact, there's been a lot of studies on emotional intelligence and the importance of it, not only in getting a job, but in keeping the job and also being coming successful and a leader in the organization. Seventy one percent of hiring professionals said that they value EQ over IQ because, among other things, they make more thoughtful and thorough decisions. And in fact, this chart shows the key attributes that employers really look for on college resumes. Um, and you'll see that a lot of those qualities are what I would call the emotional intelligence or soft qualities. The ability to work on a team, your problem solving skills, your communication skills, your leadership skills, those skills are actually more important or as important as your technical skills. And so the importance of your emotional intelligence is critical in getting the job of your dreams. Now, it's not only important in getting your, the, job, the job that you really want, but it's also in keeping the job and becoming a real leader and being successful in the institution. So, Harvard University did a very um, significant study where they looked at over 350 different corporations. And what they found is that 85% of job success comes from having well-developed soft skills and people skills. And only 15% of job success comes from technical skills and knowledge. And they really probed as to why that is the case. And what they found is that approximately 90% of high performers have really high EQ. And leaders who master empathy perform 40% higher in coaching, engaging others in decision-making. And they even looked at companies and 
what the effect is of a company that has higher empathy. And what that really means is that the senior management at the top have empathy and that trickles down throughout the corporation. And what they found is that companies with higher empathy are shown to increase in value and generate up to 50% more earnings. So not only is it important for you individually to have EQ, but it's really important for a company who's focused on the bottom line to have um, really significant emotional intelligence. The other thing that the studies have shown is not only is it easier to get a job and keep one and become a leader in the institution if you have EQ, but that you as an individual within the company will be much happier at a company that has that higher EQ. And so, Seventy eight percent of employees are willing to work longer hours for a more empathetic organization. And in fact, 82 percent of employees would consider quitting their job if, in fact, um, they had a more empathetic employer. So this all goes to show that one of the pieces of advice that I would give to you is that your emotional intelligence and your ability to really command a room, be charismatic, be likable, is more important than your raw intelligence. And part of that emotional intelligence is appearing confident. You know, a lot of you are going to be starting new jobs. You're going to be a little bit insecure, uncertain. You're not going to know exactly what to do. A lot of situations you've never confronted before. Um, most people won't tell you this, but it's important that you have a good game face. And what I mean by that is it's really important. It doesn't matter how you're feeling inside. It's very important to appear confident. Do you exude confidence? Because you will succeed um, more in your company if people feel that you're confident in what you're doing. And so I give a very good example of what I mean by a game face or, and being confident even when you don't feel it. Um, one of the first trials that I was lead trial counsel on I was cross-examining a professor at Yale University. Um, he was the key expert for the other side. And he's now a former um, professor at Yale. But it was a Friday afternoon. I was cross-examining him. And I was staying calm, cool, but I was really asking him very pointed questions. And he was getting very hostile. Um, he was getting a bit arrogant. He was evading my questions. And the more I probed and the calmer I stayed, the more aggressive he became. Now, I didn't feel at the time that I was getting the answers that I needed. And he was a critical witness. So I had enough sense to ask the judge if I could have the weekend to continue to prepare my cross-examination. I told the judge it would, it would streamline the process. But really what I wanted to do is I was feeling a little bit like I was not succeeding, that I was really failing in the cross-examination. So the judge said, fine. And we stopped for the day. And then I went out for a drink with my client, who was the chief counsel of a Fortune 10 company. Now, this woman happened to have been a CIA agent for the past 10 years before she became the chief counsel. And she was able to read a room better than anybody. And what she said to me uh, while we were having drinks is that she didn't think I should ask this expert any more questions. The, the jury hated him. The jury felt he was condescending, that nothing he said was going to be believable. 
And I had to give it a lot of thought over the weekend because he was such a critical witness and I really didn't get the sort of concessions that I wanted. But at the end of the day, I decided that that was the right move. And on Monday morning, I got up before the judge and I said, Your Honor, we have no further questions for this witness. And a lot of the attorneys were very surprised. And two of the women jurors did what they're not supposed to do. They started clapping. And so I knew at that moment that I had made the right decision. Um, I also knew from that experience that it was really important to stay cool, calm, and collected and not really reveal how I was feeling on the inside. Now, I will tell you there was a lot of discussion um, at that time as to whether um, the witness was coming off as sexist, um, whether um, he would have responded the same way had I been an elderly white, white male attorney. And the conclusion was he would, he would not. And what I learned through the experience is as a woman or a woman of color, um, you are going to have to navigate a lot of stereotypes that senior people think, um, even today. We call it subconscious bias. Back then, we called it stereotypical ways of thinking about women or women of color. And some of them are being emotional, weak, angry, conniving. But here's my advice to you. You're going, to nav you're going to have to navigate that in your career. Um, some companies more than others, some juries more than others, some judges more than others. But it's really important that you de develop your own voice, that you stay calm, you be poised, be overprepared, find your allies, find your role models within the institution, and be persistent. I think the best example of asserting yourself, but doing it in a very calm and poised way is what happened in the last month. Um, some of you might have watched um, the hearings um, where Judge Jackson um, was being cross-examined. And um, I looked at it from an attorney's perspective. Um, some of you might have looked at it from a different perspective. But what was very clear to me and others in my profession is there was nothing that was going to rattle her. It didn't mean, matter what type of question she got, how ridiculous the question was, or how merit, uh, meritless the question was. She was going to stay poised and calm, and she was not going to let anyone get under her skin. And so as a result of her performance, even senators that voted against her found her likable, found that she had done a good job overall of answering the questions. So when you're confronted with situations where you feel are a little bit unfair or you feel that you're being stereotyped, um, the, the key is you're gonna have to navigate those situations in the calmer, and the more professional and the more prepared you are, the better that you're going to do. Um, now, I've, ta I've talked about appearing confident, but sometimes the gig is up. And what I mean by that is sometimes it's really clear um, that um, you have revealed um, that you're not as confident as you are. And so you've got to pivot. You gotta keep your sense of humor. You've gotta not take yourself so seriously and you've gotta balance that confidence with a good sense of humor. I tell this story, uh, actually a lot of my colleagues tell this story. The first trial, it was the first trial I had ever done where I actually put on a witness. And we had a document that we call a smoking gun document. And what that means is if we got that document in, we were likely going to win the trial. And so I was pushing really hard to get the document in. And we were fighting amongst the jury. And the judge asked for a sidebar. And what a sidebar is, you go right in front of the jury, uh, right in front of the judge, so the jury cannot hear. And then you argue with a court reporter. So the judge had asked for a sidebar. I walk up 
And I try to do it as confidently as I could. And just by chance, my heel or my shoe got caught in the carpet walking up to the judge. And I literally fell on my face and I hit a bookcase and a bunch of books were just falling out. And I'm picking up the books and the jury's looking at me, the judge is looking at me, everybody in the courtroom is looking at me. And I finally, after a minute, I sit down right near the, um, the judge and the judge in a very sweet but very quiet way says to me, Ms. Cohen, I'm sorry, but I think that seat is for the court reporter. And I say in a very soft way, I'm so sorry, Your Honor, you probably don't know this, but this is my first sidebar. And the judge in a voice that was a little louder than I would like, he said, Ms. Cohen, I think everybody knows this is your first sidebar. And in fact, I think the jury knows. And I looked at the judge, I started smiling, I started laughing. The jury started laughing, everybody in the room started laughing and we actually had to take a break. And then after that incident, I could do no wrong in front of the jury or the judge. I became more human, I became more relatable. And so whenever we wanted a document that we needed um, in, um, introduced in the case, I would be always the one to argue it. If we had a difficult argument, I was the one who took it. So my, my advice is it is important to be confident and exude that confidence. But I think it's also, you have to actually balance it against times where you'll hit a bump in the road and keep your sense of humor because I think it's really important. And that incident was, um, was really um, pretty traumatic for me at the time, but luckily I had great role models, which is my next um, big piece of advice. When you get to your job, pick a great mentor, pick a great role model. A lot of companies and law firms allow you to pick the person. They're not usually chosen for you. But it's important that you pick someone that you can relate to and that you like, but there are two other qualities that are even more important. And one is that it's very important to pick a role model or a mentor that is powerful within the organization. Because at the end of the day, you want to grow professionally, you want to succeed. And the more powerful your mentor is, the more they are able to help you succeed within the organization. And the other thing that I would say is not all role models will give you credit for your ideas. So sometimes you'll come up with a creative idea and some role models, some mentors will basically suggest that it was theirs. So you want someone that's not only powerful within the institution, but you want someone that's gonna give you credit for your ideas, basically advance your career, help advance your career, and let you take credit for things that were really your ideas. Um, the other advice that I will give is be a problem solver, especially when you start within these companies. You're gonna get a lot of questions on um, how, uh, you know, they're gonna ask you to analyze problems. Um, when you're asked to analyze problems or do research, I always remember the junior associates that came to me that analyzed the problems, but also gave me solutions, gave me ideas on how to pro uh, solve the problems. Now, I didn't always agree with them, but the fact that they took some initiative was really important. So that is a way of really standing out. And my last piece of advice is pick a job that you love. Some of you don't know what that is at this point, but some of you do. And so my advice is pick something that you're passionate about, but also pick an environment that you're gonna feel comfortable. From a very early age, um, when I started out as a baby associate, as a first year associate, when I graduated um, law school, I picked a firm that was very eclectic, that was very diverse. Um, and I did that because I felt that I would be more comfortable in that environment. It was very similar to the high school that I went to 
Um, and I got a lot out of it. And so I did. And I was much happier as a result of it. But what I didn't understand at the time is that companies that value diversity, that uh, value um, having women in leadership positions or women of color in leadership positions, they are more likely to be financially successful. So companies that really embrace diversity, the studies show that it really affects the economic bottom line. And the best, one of the best studies um, that was done was done by an organization called Catalyst. Catalyst is a woman's organization that has done research for the past 50 to 75 years. And in a recent studies, um, in a recent study, they found that companies with the highest representation of women on their senior management teams had a 35.35% higher return on equity and a 34% higher total return to shareholders than those with the lowest representation. And other studies have confirmed this. Whether you look at the Pepperdine University study, you look at the McKinsey report or Deloitte has done studies all of these show that putting women in leadership positions help the bottom line. Um, the McKinsey report is very noteworthy because a lot of corporations have been looking at it. And as this shows, the McKinsey report shows businesses in the top quartile for gender diversity were 15 more times likely to outperform their competitors. And this medium chart shows that. This chart shows that the medium annual net profit margins for firms are much higher for companies that embrace women in leadership positions. There's a direct correlation between women in leadership positions and the profitability of those companies. And it is also true for racial diversity. There's been a lot of studies by McKinsey and other companies um, that evaluate whether racially diverse companies outperform their competitors. And what McKinsey study has shown, and this is one of the more fulsome studies, they show the companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above the national industry mediums. So the bottom line is not only might you feel more comfortable in those environments, choosing a company that's more racially diverse, has more women in le leadership positions, um, those companies are more likely to be successful economically. And one of the best companies in the world is L'Oreal. L'Oreal has been in the forefront of this um, goal for the past 20 to 25 years. They recognize very early on that women in leadership positions increase the profitability of, the, of their company. And so what they did um, is they increased their female representation on the boards from 21 to 46%. They increased their female representation on their executive committee from 10 to 50%. They, their workforce is now close to 70%. And what their own study has shown is that their profitability has increased by threefold. And while there are a lot of factors that go into it, um, they believe there's a direct correlation between their increase in women in leadership positions to their profitability. So the last piece of advice is pick a firm that you love, but if you pick a firm that has a lot of diversity and a lot of women or racially diverse candidates in leadership positions, 
you're more likely to stay at that firm. And more importantly, that firm is more likely to be economically successful, which I'm sure translates into um, your job being more economically successful. So I'm going to end here. Um, I don't see the, um, doesn't say, it says new share. Um, so I'm going to end here and with a couple things. Oh, there we go. Stop sharing. Yep. Okay. So there's an expression that a lot of people use is if you pick a job that you love, you will never work a day in your life. Now, I'll be honest, I think it's a bunch of crock, um, but there's something to it because you're gonna spend most of you a lot of time at your job. You're gonna make a lot of new friends. Um, you will maybe even spend more time with people at work than you do with your loved ones at home. And if you pick a job that you love, you'll be happier, you'll feel lighter, it will be easier to forge your own path. Um, you'll feel different. And so um, I wish everybody a lot of luck. Um, it's great speaking with you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Wow, that's quite inspiring. <laughs> I wish I was starting my career all over again. <laughs> so that I didn't have to learn so many of those things the hard <laughs> way by trial and error. <laughs> we, we, we do have quite a few questions coming in. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who appreciated your remarks about the hearings for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, my favorite moment in the whole thing was when Ted Cruz pulled out the, the preschool <laughs> children's book it was the only moment in the entire hearings where I saw the tiniest little crack of a smile at the corner of her mouth. And I thought, now that is self-control on a scale that I do not know I could ever muster. Um, the first question, in fact, uh, from a professional staff member is about those hearings. She said, it, it says, can you comment on the attacks against Brown Jackson? for representing clients that others might consider reprehensible. Isn't this a necessary right, the right to an attorney that underlies our justice system? So a couple things, um, just to, to comment on your uh, comment and then answer the question. <laughs> you know, a lot of times when I'm in a courtroom, um, I will have a white um, elderly male attorney interrupt me. And I will say, I'm so sorry. I'm sure you didn't mean to do that, but I was, I was still talking. Now, interestingly, she did not do that. And I am sure in her preps, they decided that the more she just let these senators go, the worse they looked and the better she looked. So it was a very strategic move on her part. And to answer the questions, um, absolutely. Our justice uh, system is based upon both sides having representation, whether it's a terrorist, whether it's a pedophile, what, what, regardless of the defendant, um, both sides are entitled to representation. And what I found particularly troubling was that the senators that were asking those sort of questions are the ones that knew better. These are ones that went to Harvard um, Law School. Um, they had been in the law field. And so they were just playing to an audience. They actually knew much better and she handled the questions quite well. Yeah, I mean, I think if your advice to us is uh, to, to uh, handle yourself with confidence, um, she demonstrated that there are circumstances in which the way to show the ultimate confidence and the ultimate dignity is to stay quiet and, you know, let them show themselves for what they are. And totally. I, and totally. Just, and, and she was, you could tell from how she handled the question. She was very prepared 
but these she had lived this experience her whole professional career so she had a goal in mind and she was she was perfect but i will tell you it was hard to watch at times <laughs> <laughs> i i felt the same way um i'm sure we're not alone uh, another staff member says do you watch bull on tv how accurately does it reflect the situation in real life trials? So I apologize. I do not watch Bull. Um, um, I don't even know what that show is. So I, I really can't answer that question. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question from a student who says, what was your biggest challenge in a recent trial? So... We just had a trial um, that they brought in one of the top firms in the country um, because um, we had beaten this defendant quite a bit. It was AIG. And um, the gentleman on the other side who took, who was lead counsel, he just did not take no for an answer. And so we had a judge that was a little bit wishy-washy. So she would rule on something and then he would completely ignore that she had ruled on it and then re-argue the same thing. And she, I will tell you, I felt like he bullied her, the judge a little bit, but he was very effective because at a, at a certain point, you just wanted to go on to the next issue. And so sometimes, and it's not fair, the person or the lawyer that gets the last word sometimes wins. So you really have to be strategic and recognize when that's the case and not let the opposing counsel dominate the room. And I think in our last trial, some of my more junior attorneys let this person dominate the room. And that and it was it was one of the mistakes that we made during the trial. Yeah, it, you know, when you were speaking, you actually reminded me a lot of a class that I just had last week. You know, a class called Environmental History, we were watching some interview footage with Rachel Carson after the release of Silent Spring. And she showed exactly the kind of qualities that you're trying to encourage people to have. Stay calm under fire, stick to the facts. If they try to you know, use a straw man argument against you, just debunk it right away, but do so calmly and don't lose your cool. It just, it, in some ways, it seems obvious, but of course, when you're under pressure, it's the hardest thing to remember and to stay focused on. A professional staff member asks, <clears throat> how does a majority female and person of color law firm differ from a mostly white male law firm? How does it change the office environment, the court environment, et cetera? It's, it's remarkably different. Um, what you will hear from a lot of the young associates that come from bigger firms is they don't feel the subtleties that they felt at other firms. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times women or women of color or minorities, they will get different assignments than the white men. Um, a lot of times white men will get to argue in court quicker than women or minorities. They'll get more interesting assignments. And it's not um, as overt, um, it's subtle, but it's there. Um, the other thing that is clear, and I didn't put up any slides on this, is women partners make significantly less um, than male partners who contribute the same. If you look at most compensation charts of law firms, women tend to be on the bottom. And so the way we're different is it's completely merit-based. Um, no one feels that sort of subtlety. We don't really distinguish in compensation, either overtly or covertly uh, between men and women. So I will tell you when they've come over and we've had a lot of women come over, both the associates and the partners, it's like a breath of fresh air. Um, they really see the, the really significant differences be, um, in working in an environment where there's a woman chair, where there's half women partners, and there is a commitment to diversity. It really makes a difference. 
What a concept, equal work for equal pay. Yeah. Um, you have the same question from both a professional staff member and from a student, um, which is essentially, how do you manage your work-life balance? How do you navigate your career if you also want to have children? So I um, had children a little bit later in life. So I was able to really develop my career um, um, early on without children. So I had Sammy at 38 and I had my son at 40. And so I think that was really helpful because at, by that point I was already a partner. Um, but I will tell you a lot of women at my firm um, are having um, children earlier. And I will tell you, it's very difficult. Um, the balance, I think it's easier today um, than it was back in the 80s or 90s because you can work at home because of COVID. Um, we are very flexible on um, you know, how much time you have to spend in the office, um, but it is really difficult because um, sharing that time um, is um, sometimes very difficult. You can't go to every play or you can't go to every you know, concert. Um, but I will tell you that a lot of children of working women, the children are pretty um, proud of their, of their parents. And so it's, the balancing is difficult, but at the end of the day, I think it works. Um, a senior asks, uh, What's the best way to deal with imposter syndrome? I feel like as a woman of color, I have to work twice as hard to get half the recognition. I think it's true. And I think anyone that tells you otherwise is not being honest. I think Judge Jackson's um, hearings showed that. Um, and so one of the things that I saw very early on is that I had to be more prepared I had to be more dynamic. I had to be, um, know the peer, I had to argue better. And I just think that it's a fact of life that you'll have to deal with, except if you pick a firm or a company that it embraces diversity, you'll find that that's less of the case. Um, I will tell you federal judges and state judges, they are very merit-based. Um, you might not get the same treatment from your opposing counsel, but the judges really base the arguments on merit. So if you're looking for a field where it's really merit-based, um, the law profession is if you're in a courtroom. Hmm. Um, for students, how would you recommend finding a career we love, considering there's so many options out there? I know for me, a lot of it was trial and error. So look, if you don't have a specific passion, I mean, I'm one of these people that does a lot of research. Um, and so I research uh, a lot and I try to figure out what sort of interests me and then I try it on. Um, a lot of my friends did exactly that. They, they really went from one field to the next until they found what they love. Um, you know, if you're a social person, you know, you should look at fields where it's PR or marketing or something that you're going to be able to use those intangible qualities. If you like to sit more at home, you need to look at other sort of fields. So I think the first thing I would say, and this is a little difficult, you have to be self-reflective and really figure out who you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are and then figure out what profession really is best for you. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of professional coaches out there that can really help in that regard. There, there are coaches at, at colleges, but there's coaches outside of college that really can explore that with you. We have a question from somebody who is a, an administrator, a professional staff, and a faculty member. Interesting combination. Do you think your daughter's generation will benefit from the pioneering work that you and others have done to pioneering to pioneer women's leadership in fields where women are still underrepresented? 
I definitely think so. I will tell you, my mentor was a woman by the name of Randy Parr. Um, a lot of you won't know um, um, Jack Parr, but she was Jack Parr's daughter. And Jack Parr was Johnny, it used to be on TV. Um, he was the predecessor for Johnny Carson. And, and I, what I what I realized through that, um, working with her, she really helped pave the way for my success. She was the role model and the mentor that really um, helped my career. So I really do think that our generation, my generation is really paving the way for my daughter's generation to make it a lot easier. And I do think it's easier. I don't think it's easy, but I do think it's easier for women and women of color and minorities um, at this point, but we still have a long way to go. We're running a little short of time, but I'm going to squeeze in one last question because it yeah. comes from a student. Um, how do you navigate working at a top law firm versus working for a firm that's more in line with your values? If in fact, you think it has to be one or the other. As someone who's looking to paralegal upon graduation, I'm struggling with this. So I think you can have both. Um, look, our firm is one of the top litigation boutiques. We're not a thousand person firm, but we are a firm that is in the top tier and we pay as if we're in the top tier. So what I would suggest is that if you really value diversity, you really value having women in leadership positions, um, there are a number of really great firms out there similar to ours. Um, a lot of them are smaller and a lot of them are situations where women or racially diverse attorneys left these big firms to start a boutique and have the same profitability, but have different values. So I think you can get both. I think you just have to do a lot of research and make sure you pick the right firm. And maybe be very clear in your own mind about what, what your values are that you're trying to support. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this has really been informative, but also, I hope, inspiring to a lot of the students. I mean, <clears throat> I, I want to thank Robin Cohen. I want to thank Emily again for our being such an able translator. Um, thank Ellen Fritz for the proposing the, this Common Hour and introducing it. And just remind everybody again, um, thanks to the audience, and I hope you'll join us next week for a panel discussion on bodies transgressing boundaries. Seems like a very timely topic. Um, sure. Immigration and all that, Ukrainian transmi transmigration and all that. Um, okay, everybody, thanks so much, and Bye, hope everyone. to see you next week.